Um, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you guys so much for coming out today. I know it's always, man, you guys are in school, must be like cranking on all the different things, you know. So seriously, thank you for coming out. Um, tonight what I want to do is walk you guys through some of the material from my most recent book, Sound Unbound. Now, Sound Unbound is a, a collection of essays about sound art, digital media, and what I like to call contemporary compositional strategy. Now, the reason I use the term strategy is that people are always thinking about how to put together things, um, whether it be language, whether it be you know, Lego blocks, whether it be DNA code, or whether it be computer code. But at the end of the day, these are ideas that somehow need to be, uh, how should I put this, like put into a recursive logic, someplace where we're looking at how loops and repetition and how, above all, how human beings create meaning. So we never just do one thing once. Uh, we're creatures of repetition. And I've tended to find over the course of my uh, journey in terms of electronic music and digital media that repetition in the West has always had a sort of strange, uneasy tension with this idea of originality. Now, when you think about hip hop, techno, drum and bass, of course we're near Detroit where techno was of course born, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, this, the whole idea of repetition and the, you know, the factory production line, uh, looking at the, the idea of the American city, these are things that come out of the, the sort of crucible, the narrative crucible of what the American landscape of urban culture is about. Um, so what I want to do today is walk you guys through a couple of things. First, um, tonight I'm going to be basing most of my talk off of um, my iPhone and iPad app. And I've been working with Apple uh, and Music Soft Darts to come up with a series of apps that let you do stuff like, here I'll just show you really quick. Um, and I'll be DJing a string quartet. Uh, just in a second. All right, so what it does is it just integrates your iTunes playlist um, directly, into, directly into the uh, iPad in a way that is pretty intuitive and pretty simple and straight ahead. <laughs> Right, so <laughs> um, now tools evolve. What I want to do is just show you guys, imagine if you could take almost all of the tools that I have here on this desk and condense it into your phone or into any other software application. Now, I'm a big fan of Marshall McLuhan. I'm a big fan of uh, what's been going on with the idea of how tools change culture. Now, Marshall McLuhan has a great uh, book called The Medium is the Massage, and I'm just in the middle of working on a remix of it. So um, what I'm fascinated with is how tools change the way culture functions. Now, McLuhan had this great series of phrases. In fact, he was a kind of hip hop um, MC, but way before we had, you know, um, Eric Bin Rakim and you know masters like Chuck D. And what I'm doing is working with his estate, and we are reissuing um, the record version of the Medium as the Massage. And it's a classic uh, book because what he wanted to try and do was apply graphic design technique to language. And so, uh, but it was not very well known that he had actually made a record version of it. And um, I collect records. So uh, we found a couple studio sessions where he went in the studio. That's MC McLuhan. Um, you know. And so he would record every sound in the book and make these kind of really interesting uh, vocal takes on it and then make cut up versions of it. So with the iPhone app, what I was thinking about is this notion of post McLuhan, where in the 21st century, the medium is the massage, the idea of the global village, all of these things that McLuhan was sort of talking about in the 60s have come home to roost. The internet has changed the way that we think about, for example, exchange of information, the idea of open source digital media, all of these things were um, things of theory in another era, but now they're things of fact. So imagine if the saxophone hadn't been invented in 1841 by Adolf Sax. Um, the saxophone was a tool. It was a military uh, device, usually for ensembles to, you know, brass ensembles and bands in Europe for marching. 
And um, someone altered it, you know, there's a gentleman by the name of Adolf Sachs, and we got this term, saxophone. And so if you think about Charlie Parker or John Coltrane or so many of the masters of this 20th, 20th century vernacular of jazz, they wouldn't have been able to play if that tool hadn't existed. So for the 21st century, our tools are software. And when we think about language and the idea of code, these are things that um, some of my favorite writers like Lawrence Lessig, who started Creative Commons, have really kind of bought home to roost. I mean, he has a great book called The Future of Ideas. Um, and in the 21st century, that's what I'm finding more and more is a scarce thing. Ideas are our most scarce resource. Um, now, when we think about we live in this era of oil and we're just at the edge of this idea of economic and imperial collapse with Iraq, you know, and so on. Um, oil, there's a great phrase that the Saudi minister of oil said a couple of years ago. He said, the stone age didn't end for lack of stone. You know, and when you think about tools and the stone age and a lot of people were, you know, there was a lot of stone, right? And they said, well, we don't need to use stone anymore. Let's try wood, steel, and other things. For our culture, um, we're moving more and more into a dematerialized, very etherealized world of software. And those are our tools. But more and more, the rare and most scarce thing is an idea. So if you think about Google, I'll just give you a quick example. They incorporated in around 1998, and Gmail has only been around about seven years. YouTube has only been around for a couple of years, and in fact, it wasn't even around during the last election. Most people kind of have forgotten that. And you think about these new tools and new ways of thinking about, now YouTube is the most popular website on Earth, um, and more people upload the images of every da daily life um, than most people have lived in an entire um, epoch of our species. So the sheer volume of data going out of our species at this point um, is in the era of like what they, area of what they call zettabytes. There's petabytes, you know, exabytes. It's a long story, but anybody out there who's a mathematician, you, it's exponential. Um, so the reason I love McLuhan is he was a lyrical figure. He was able to really play with language in a way that hip hop also plays with language. And people like him or James Joyce or William S. Burroughs are big inspirations to me because they got the idea of the cut up technique. So let me just show you a quick example um, of a mix. And this is a project I'm working on, like I said before, with Apple. And we've, um, had a, we've basically had over about 3.5 million downloads. And it's been in the top 20 of um, iPhone app downloads, because I guess there's a lot of DJs, right? Um, everybody mixes. And if you think about how many people have iTunes playlists, the generic version of the model is called the DJ Mixer. And um, my customized version, you know, we, we based on what econ economists like to now call freemium model. You give it away free, and then you have additional functionality at a, a different level. So say, for example, if I wanted to just do something like this. So, the party is not now, but <laughs> um, I love the fact that all the functionality of this has now evolved into this dematerialized uh, function of stuff like this. So what I was just doing was layering um, bits and pieces of these two songs uh, that we give away in the iPhone app, and we embed um, them with this idea of waveform charts, which um, I don't want to get too technical, but basically a sound is a wave and a waveform is what we've digitally encoded and made available as a file. 
So what you're essentially looking at is how technology has allowed us to capture every moment of an expression. So one of my favorite influences for my work is Glenn Gould. And um, I'm going to kind of do an example of this. And I'd like to invite the Ross Eels Ensemble out. Come on up. <clears throat> Uh, so that's local flavor, right? Um, basic vibe is what I want to do is a quick demonstration of this idea of sampling. But instead of sampling records, we're going to sample a string quartet. And notions here of how live versus pre-recorded material can function is something that I think with the 21st century we're going to be seeing a lot more of as this century unfolds. So um, it's a long story. I went to Bowdoin College in Maine. And Bowdoin, oh, you've heard of it, OK. <laughs> Bowdoin um, was a tiny little school, and I, I went there precisely because of that, and I wanted to get away from big cities. Um, tonight, I'm going to be walking you guys through some of the issues that I think the city itself is kind of a, a logic machine. And if you think about Detroit, Washington, D.C., L.A., Chicago, the logic of the American city is the grid. It's how we organize space and time in America. And there's a kind of New England transcendentalist movement that I always like to refer to of Emerson, Thoreau, Walt Whitman, and so on. And if you think about the collision between nature versus artificial, you know, the, the landscape of the city, I think classical music is kind of the landscape of a different era, and hip hop is the landscape of this hypermodern, grid oriented American quantized landscape. Hip hop, techno, drum and bass, you know, the, the sound of the production line, the repetition of the factories, all of that has been distilled into a kind of a music form that people have used to create new meanings. So, Tonight, what I want to do is walk you all through um, a piece called Bach's Goldberg Variations. And it's a remix inspired by uh, Glenn Gould, who um, wrote a really good essay called The Prospects of Recording. Um, essentially, Glenn Gould was such a good pianist, he said, look, I'm going to play the riff. I don't need to play it anymore. I've already recorded it. And so after a certain point of his career, he stopped playing live at all and just remixed his recordings. Now, this was a radical move in the 60s and early 70s. And what ended up happening is he just stopped playing altogether and said, look, just listen to the recording. I've already done it. Uh, <laughs> so when I first started DJing, um, my DJ nickname was DJ Spooky because it was meant to be a sense of humor, like you could just press play and walk off stage and the music's still going. Uh, it's very David Lynch, you know? Um, and the sense of humor is that I majored in philosophy and there was, a, in, I, it's a long story again, I always have these little hidden hyperlinks here. But um, the notion that unheimlich, this is a German term for the uncanny, something that is something you're not quite sure about that pulls you out of the unhomeliness, of un unfamiliarity. Now, anybody out there into philosophy or psychology, it's a term that Sigmund Freud popularized. But again, there was something in this German culture that, you know, Box Goldberg variations or Sigmund Freud, they were dealing with this idea of the collision of the industrial versus post-industrial issues of the Protestant work ethic and so on and so on and so on. But classical music was usually a mirror held up to a society in change. Uh, Haydn you know, helped popularize the string quartet. Uh, you can think about Scriabin uh, as someone who was trying to deal with multimedia. You can think about John Cage as a composer who was dealing with this idea of noise and complexity. So let's update the formula and think about modal repetition. Uh, Box Goldberg variations, um, again, it's, it's about motifs. So what you're going to hear tonight is think about hip hop without beats. And um, Box Goldberg variations really go straight into the heart of techno, drum and bass, dubstep but way before these mediums evolved. And so uh, it's a long story, but Bach was, I think, one of the few composers to get repetition before people like Philip Glass and Steve Reich. Uh, you can think about minimalism and minimalism's relationship to hip hop and techno and all these kinds of things. So Kraftwerk, Philip Glass, all of these people in the 70s and 80s who were trying to deal with motifs, you can still go back to Bach and hear it. So um, let's jump in and give a quick demo of this. Here we go. It's going to take a second to load.
By the way, we just met today. <laughs> so what I was just doing was layering electronic uh, renditions of the strings with the live versions of the strings, mixing hip hop with it in a way that you have this quantized sense of rhythm. And you can also think of the modal patterns that would actually go into how people play kind of an update of classical music. So when you think about the 1970s and the rise of minimalism in American culture, um, you had sculptures, you had uh, people like Donald Judd, uh, you had also a lot of situations going on in the downtown world of what it ended up being called hip hop. But at the time, it was really not that welcome on the scene. And so what I want to do is play uh, a kind of a little bit of catch up with some of the issues thinking about American landscape. Um, <clears throat> behind me, you have the cover of Scientific American from 1915. And this is by one of my favorite photographers, Eddie and Jules Murray. And he helped popularize this idea of what they call stop motion photography. Now, what ends up happening with stop motion photography is essentially that um, it breaks motion to small component elements. And so you can think of it as a visual equivalent of sampling. Um, and what ends up happening with the 20th versus 21st century is that the role of the sample has really evolved. In fact, we no longer think of a sample as a fragment. We think of it as just a tool to be mixed into the old notion of what normally would be a seamless sequence of sounds or images. So when you think of like a visual rendition of, of film, actually you're just seeing edited clips and versions of things sequenced in a way to tell a story. So the editing process becomes an art form in its own right. And that's what I think hip hop really brought home to Roos is that the idea of how you edit a sound how you edit the recording becomes an art form. Now, the avant-garde in Europe had been doing this for most of the, of the beginning of the 20th century. You can think about Marcel Duchamp's Nude Descending the Stairs, for example, as a, you know, trying to painterly do a rendition of this. Um, you can think of the Italian futurists. Um, there's a guy by the name of Luigi Russolo, who I always love to refer to, because he created this term, what he calls the art of noise. Now, in 1915, the art of noise came out, but also in 1915, one of my, uh, favorite and kind of bizarrely twisted films, D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of a Nation, also came out. <laughs> now, I got the rights to D.W. Griffith's film because he left his estate to MoMA and to Harvard. And I ended up working with his estate, um, you know, not, uh, not necessarily as something that he would enjoy. <laughs> um, but let's show you um, this really quickly so you can get an idea. Um, art and rebirth. Yeah. So, this is a very famous film, and what ended up happening is um, Griffith created this idea that the art form of editing could tell a story made of fragments and create an, an, an entire mythology around the film Birth of a Nation based on American uh, issues of racial politics and paranoia. So let me uh, play you a quick clip of this film and give you an idea of how Griffith really, I think, responded to... Actually, actually I'll play you a better resolution. Uh, where is it? Okay, video. You guys get a little tour of my hard drive here. All right, there's the rebirth of a nation. Reasonably resolution. Um, all right, so what ends up happening with birth of a nation and rebirth of a nation is that you end up getting this kind of uh, issue of how storytelling would be the, the basic frame of reference for most of the 20th century, but storytelling with new technologies. Film was radically new at the time. In fact, people would get up and run if they saw a train coming out of the screen. So what ended up happening with D.W. Griffiths is that he was a master storyteller and he was a master propagandist. Um, later on, of course, you can think of Birth of a Nation as the DNA of American cinema. So most of the racial politics um, derives from this idea of paranoia, of uh, sexual aggression, and a conflict between class and race. So, of course, one funny part of the film is it was one of the first ones to really popularize the idea of the minstrel show. So that's the DNA of American pop culture, but we, it's a hidden and subconscious impulse. Um, sampling identity is something Americans do very well. You know? So let's um, check this out, and I'd be very curious to hear what everyone thinks about. When I, when I presented this film live, um, I ended up getting the Greek government to give me the Acropolis for an evening, which is very hard to do. <laughs> 
Um, and let's just show you the photos for a second. This is hip hop, so this is how we do it. Um, basically, what ends up happening is uh, there was a festival called the Hellenic Festival, and they approached me to do a, a concert. So I was like, well, how about we play Rebirth of a Nation at the Acropolis? And the Greeks were like, but why do you want to play a KKK film at the Acropolis? <laughs> and so I can be very persuasive sometimes. So uh, we got them to give us the Acropolis for an evening. And I said, well, you know, the kids would love a crazy KKK film, right? <laughs> um, so we put a huge sound system throughout the ruins. And I projected it on a triptych. These three screens are very big. You can see that's a person there, so you get the sense of scale. And we projected the film throughout the ruins. Now, one of the funny things about the Acropolis is it's this, it's this monument to permanence. Um, if you think about the, the, the core of Western philosophies of, of monumentalism and to this whole idea that you have architecture respond to the mythology of, of Western ideals of progress, uh, the Acropolis represents the heart of that. So getting the Greek government to do that, I was like, well, they were like very hesitant. They're like, it's a, but it is a crazy racist film. I was like, yeah, well, you know, it's America, you know, let's, that's, <laughs> um, and let's try and figure this out here. So I was like, you know, you guys are Greek, right? You had comedy, tragedy, you know, theater. And they're like, oh, I get it, okay. So the Greeks were like, it's theater, you know? So this is the Herod Atticus Theater at the base of the Acropolis. You can see this in the logo of like um, a lot of film companies, for example, they still use this. But basically actors used to come out in the middle of this place and the, the acoustics were set up so that you could hear someone whisper. The characters would wear a comedy mask or a tragedy mask, you know, the, the, the smile or the frown. Um, and, but what I did was got rid of that stage and put a DJ set up where all the characters are, and I edited the film live. And so let's just play you the trailer to give you a sense of what this is about. I had Kronos Quartet play uh, my compositions for this film. Here we go, one second, it's gonna take you. Smoke? Oh, thank you. Is that D.W. Griffith? Yes. He made the birth of a nation. Now I want to ask you a question. Far ahead. When you made the birth of a nation, you feel as though it were true? The clan at that time was needed and served a purpose. Yes, I think it's true. President Woodrow Wilson, the 28th President of the United States, the son of Confederate sympathizers, struggles with an escalating war in Europe, a woman's right to vote, and a country still recovering from a devastating civil war. While in the throes of his attempt to create the League of Nations in 1915, Woodrow Wilson saw a very different vision for the internal political situation in America than he did with his international idealism. The League of Nations was an attempt to foster what he called an organization to end all wars. To premiere his vision, he invited his close friend and fellow Confederate son, D.W. Griffin, to screen The Birth of a Nation at the White House, making it the first film to play there in American history. The birth of a nation set the tone for how film portrayed history. It still fuels the debate about how much progress has or hasn't occurred, its impact on society, and whether such a film should have ever been made. In modern 21st century America, a world of red states and blue states, the birth of a nation hangs as a specter over the political process. Ultimately, the birth of a nation is about conflict. It shows us controversy and a deep ignorance of history in the form of a film once described by Woodrow Wilson as writing history with lightning. There was something in the tradition of America's first pop culture phenomenon, the minstrel show, showing multiple ideas about American identity and set the tone for the 21st century's revisionist landscape media and the absence or presence of a story in that media could set off a war or could literally create a vision of democracy rising in the deserts of another foreign occupied nation. The 
rebirth of a nation looks at Griffith's vision of America tied together with never before seen close ups and innovative techniques and turns them on themselves to make a film from the viewpoint of DJ culture. The turntable moves to become the projector. The projector becomes the multimedia file. And all of those things look back through history as a digital media where stories can be made as we go. The rebirth of a nation is a DJ mix applied to cinema. It's been said that those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. But what happens if we break the cycle? What is Pontius Pilate said truth? What is the truth? So <clears throat> when I was putting that together, I was looking at a lot of archival footage and was trying to figure out how do you tell a story made from this idea of a myth that became the, the, the cornerstone of American cinema. Um, and if you think about, say for example, this is one of the most influential films of the 20th century. Say, I'll give you one or two examples, like Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now, uh, where he plays Wagner and there are these helicopters about to bomb a village. That's one, a very sampled scene. Or George Lucas's immense battles um, in Star Wars, for example, with Jar Jar Binks and so on. Um, there's lots and lots and lots of resonance going on with that film. So what I wanted to do was apply DJ techniques, sampling, layering, editing, to the process of modern storytelling, which is the multimedia clip, which is the YouTube men mentality, or the Flickr, or YouTube, and you know, Vimeo, and so on. So what we did was uh, edit the film to um, video clips that you could remix the stories of the characters and then have it be still be a film. And it, we, it's been very successful. We've had thousands and thousands and thousands of people come out to the shows. Um, but what I really am fascinated with is the, fa the funny sense of humor about going back to, again, wordplay. A lot of early DJs would call themselves, you know, Grandmaster Flash or Grand Wizard Theodore. Um, those are the guys who invented scratching as we know it. But they also didn't know that there's a KKK titles. So it's one thing to be a Grand Wizard, you know, in Kentucky. Uh, another thing to be a Grand Wizard in the South Bronx, you know. <laughs> um, so the hints here are that we're looking at mixing, collage, layering, sampling, all of that as a way of modern navigation of information terrain. Um, and what ends up happening when you think about fragments and sampling in general is digital literacy, being able to read the landscape. Now, America's the, you know, our cities are based on the grid. Um, there's a whole utopian movement that was, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Ebenezer Howard who came with these series of, of ways of trying to organize the American city way back in the late 19th century. Um, and he called them garden cities. And they would end up setting up urban landscapes, uh, you know, based on that. But also, if you look at Washington, D.C., uh, it has a utopian and also Masonic um, architectural formats so of the grid. Um, the circles were always, you know, if you, I grew up near DuPont Circle. Um, most of these kinds of places are kind of meant to be garden cities where there was American utopian impulse. But you can see the end result in places like Detroit or, you know, the urban decay of the infrastructure of the cities um, that we all call home. Um, and I love using this idea of the, the, the reverse garden or the reverse engineering of this imagination of utopia um, to pull people into the Robert Moses vision. Now, Robert Moses was an urban planner who essentially was responsible for creating hip hop. I know it's a very um, paradoxical point of view, but what he ended up doing was uh, bulldozing a lot of the neighborhoods in the South Bronx to create the Cross Bronx Expressway. And he destroyed the parks where the kids would hang out. Now, the kids had no social space anymore, so you saw this very uneasy tension between public space and private expression. The parks were places of gathering, but by erasing them and getting rid of this idea of the garden city, um, he wanted to put huge arteries, he called them urban you know, arteries. Um, and what ended up happening is it was devastating for the landscape. Now, for 21st century culture, the highway, the Cross Bronx Expressway, all of this is still very problematic for New York. Um, and now, I'm not going to get too deep into the architecture because we only have a certain amount of time, but the whole notion that these places were essentially meant to be thoroughfares instead of social gathering spaces. There's a critic named Jane Jacobs who wrote a great book um, critiquing this kind of idea, and I, I come from more of her side of things where you think about places where people gather, and that's what music's about, social gathering spaces. So when you think about digital literacy and the idea of reading the grid, the idea of the QR code print that you see, you see behind me. This is some of my artwork. I always like playing with visual information. And uh, most of my canvas works and the materials that I've been generating for the last several years incorporates this kind of material. 
Uh, my book, Sound Unbound, was 36 essays about this kind of thing, where I even got the senior legal counsel to Google. She's a major rock star lawyer, Daphne Keller. I got her to write about sampling. Um, Steve Reich wrote the introduction, Pierre Boulez, uh, Chuck D from Public Enemy, and many others. But the idea here is that hip hop, techno, drum and bass, they haven't had the same layered histories that classical music and jazz have had. In fact, they've barely been around for nearly as long. So I wanted to get a kind of discourse going. Now, I even tracked down the guy who invented the record cover sleeve. Uh, he's a gentleman by the name of Alex Steinweiss. Um, and in the 1920s, and 30s, uh, records used to be kind of blank. They were just gray cardboard sleeves. So I always like to think of like, how did the graphic design of the record cover sleeve influence the 20th century's imagination? Um, he would go into, you know, you go into a record store and it'd just be blank gray sleeves. Um, so one day he walked into uh, Columbia and said, you know, why are all the record covers blank? Why don't we put an image to give you an idea of what the sound is like? So that little square, that little icon that you normally see as a record cover sleeve is now evolved to um, the same kind of dimensionality as the iPhone app, right? So you can go straight from the record cover sleeve to the idea of the poster, now down to this kind of micro niche thing of the app cover, and you can still see that there's this urge to condense and have a visual sound bite. That's sampling. So whenever you go into a record store, try this as an experiment and guess what the sound is like just by the image. You, the same process happens with iPhone apps, which have now become one of the most influential software media uh, in the 21st century. So all of this is to say, um, I know maybe you guys were coming here expecting me to be like, oh, everybody in the house, you know, like kind of. Um, <laughs> but I, I, that's, that's another lecture, right? This is the artsy lecture. Um, so when you think about visual literacy, these are things that I think the idea of living in a culture of recordings, which is what we'd live. Most of you probably will hear or see something as a recording before you experience it as a live event. And that's something that the 21st century, we're gonna be moving further and further into this culture that Glenn Gould and Marsha McLuhan predicted. <clears throat> so when I was coming with my iPhone app, I wanted to think about this idea of the portable studio, giving people tools to be able to create, download, upload, edit, and transform material, recorded media, uh, quickly and easily. And like I said before, we've had um, several million downloads of it, and it's been one of the more popular software tools. Now, I want to ask the audience, has anybody out there heard of Garrett A. Morgan? Anybody? No? Oh, okay. He's an African-American inventor who was very competitive with uh, Thomas Edison. He's one of the first black millionaires. He invented hair straightening cream, and that's where... <laughs> um, but his most famous invention was the street light. Now, one day he was on his way home in 1923 and he saw a Model T Ford car hit a horse carriage in the middle of an intersection. And you gotta remember, American landscape, even though it was the grid, it was unregulated. And people would just go and come and you'd have cars, horses, mo motorcycles, bicycles, you know, just kind of going randomly. And seeing that collision of different time periods, the Model T Ford car representing the modernism of the early 20th century, the horse carriage representing the, the transportation modes of another era, Seeing that collision, he went home and created the street light. So what I like to think about with the street light is he gave a sense of choreography to the landscape of dancing with the city. I'm sure if any of you have ever gone to Times Square and you've seen millions of people cross when the, you, know, you have red, yellow, green, start, stop, slow down. That sense of dancing with the landscape, dancing with the city, is something I really think, like to think about as hip hop, techno's inheritance from this gentleman's invention. Now, when you think about the regulated landscape and this idea of quantized movement, you can easily see stuff like break dancing and the sense of dancing with the geometry as inheritors of that same impulse of what I was showing you earlier with Eddie and Jules Moray's stop motion photography. The break is the cut. Now, playing with fragments, playing with bits and pieces of things, this is how we tell stories. Um, now, I, I wanna do one last thing, which is show you guys um, one of the first films to really deal with sampling. Hold on one second here. En 1900, il y a donc presque 100 ans, Méliès représente ce qu'il était réellement dans la vie, un homme orchestre.
So that's storytelling as told by edits. Now, two of my favorite filmmakers, Méliès and Orson Welles, were both magicians. And they wanted to apply magic technique to film to come up with this notion of storytelling with the editing form as a kind of magic. And I love the fact that we now, after a century of editing and a century of being able to d dive into the fragments of how media affects the imagination, how media affects the psychology of a person, we now have seen with people like Lenny Riefenstahl or D.W. Griffith or Bush, for that matter, um, how a story can create a massive amount of influence in the real world. Say, for example, many of us know that weird fiction that we like to call the Iraq War. You know, it's a trillion dollar fiction that, of course, we remember those weapons of mass destruction that were in the media that everyone's conveniently forgotten, right? So that's a story, you know? And once it was in the media, and once there was a whole layer of how people responded to that information, you could easily see how propaganda and different forms of using media to create tension and fear were easily uh, kind of routed through the culture of what was going on at that time. So I think as the 21st century progresses and we have more tools to decode these meanings, more tools to be able to democratize how people create meaning from media, that's where you're gonna see the world, I'm sorry, the role of the DJ become more ubiquitous. So when I have 3.5 million downloads of an iPhone app called DJ Mixer or DJ Spooky, that was what I was going for. So let's, um, I'm gonna close out today with the ensemble again. Here we have the Rossless <laughs> ensemble. And I wanna do an, a little bit of an update of what Méliès was talking about back in the day. And what you're gonna see here is, um, I like to call it a kind of a vision of a different America. Um, so when you look at D.W. Griffiths, and when you think about what he called writing history with lightning, I like to think of DJ culture as decoding and pulling things apart so that you can add this idea of the remix to things. Nothing is stable. History is always about revisions and edits. And um, it's a funny thing. A friend of mine uh, is a gentleman by the name of Julian Schnabel. He's, he has a film that's just coming out called Mural that's getting a lot of controversy. And uh, me and some friends from Palestine were talking about history and the Middle East and the fact that the, we had this, one of the phrases that stayed in my memory is like, they have so much history, they have no future. You know, it's kind of because people have been burdened with history so much that they're locked into certain response mechanisms that a war that seems endless can go on. Um, so it's what's eerie about that is there's a not a sense of play. And what I'm gonna show you now is a uh, remix of about the last hundred years of culture, uh, mainly looking at this idea of human rights and civil rights. Um, this was commissioned by the NAACP, and I played it before President Obama uh, a little while ago at the NAACP's 100th anniversary. And it was a real pleasure to go through their archive, because they documented all the civil rights movement and a lot of the human rights movement, and gave me access to their footage. So it was my kind of response to the D.W. Griffith thing. So I like to call these projects Director as DJ. Um, my more recent projects are, where, are basically about environmental issues, and I'm gonna, I would talk about that another time. We don't have enough time. But um, what you're gonna see here, uh, when I went down to Antarctica, it's kind of a funny thing. I'll, you know what? It's easier just to show you. Okay, one second here. I always like to uh, get people to a sense of humor. Hold on one second. All right, da -da -da. okay. There we go. <laughs> That's me in Antarctica, okay? Now, black people like ice, right? They have this whole, there's a funny thing going on with when you have people like ice tea, ice cube. Uh, if you got the white guy, you got vanilla ice, you know? And the whole sense of humor about patterns, and if you think about global culture and the way that we always respond to context, nature is something that's a context. So there's, these are some of the major air currents that are changing the way that we view the environment. And so, when you're hearing me talk about this, by the way, there's wordplay, there's a sense of humor, and above all, that's what hip hop's take on language is. It's an irreverent use of language as a tool to decode the things around you. So going down to Antarctica, I took a studio and went to all the main ice fields and did what I call acoustic portraits of ice. Um, but that's a different lecture. So hold on uh, one second here. Uh, just to give you a little, again, sample here. Uh, where did I put that picture? <laughs> Hold on, it's just, just uh, where did I put it? I have so many images here. Is it, uh, no, it wouldn't be this disaster, would it? No, that's, that's actually real, hold on. Uh, all right, uh, remixing, here we go. 
The problem with uh, remixing is you still have to deal with reality, and reality is pretty twisted these days. Um, I, it's very difficult to remix Fukushima in Japan, for example. It's not something you want to... It's a tragedy that um, human beings, we always tend to apply our own values of short-term thinking to something that is essentially a very long-term thing. Okay, so um, Iceberg Slim, sort of the DNA of hip-hop, uh, Soul and Ice by Eldridge Cleaver, and of course, Vanilla Ice, you can't, you know. Um, and there's a whole layer that goes on with this idea of the frigid person, but there's a gentleman by the name of Robert Ferris Thompson who has a great book called uh, you know, Flash of the Spirit, and he's a historian of African culture at Yale University, and he has some really good essays about the birth of the cool. Now, what ends up happening with jazz, Miles Davis, so many people in the 1920s, of course, was the color blue. Now, what's interesting with hip hop and with jazz, there's a very different kind of situation. Blues was about coolness, it was about keeping contained. Hip hop is about expression and openness. Even the body language is always very different. Um, and I love the fact that there was this kind of uneasy tension between the sociology of blues, which the 20th century was about transforming the individual into this kind of you know, mass-produced, you know, kind of psychology here, uh, to hip-hop's trying to like, be fiercely individualistic, but still very eerily conformist. Um, I don't wear any logos, and I'm not really here to kind of think about, that's a different topic as well. But at the end of the day, the American cycle of, like, critiquing this kind of stuff is eerie and bizarre. Hold on one second. And let's just play you uh, the last piece of the, t of the evening as a kind of hopefully uplifting uh, piece. And it just was really heartwarming to go through all this footage of people struggling for change. And I think right now, in the 21st century, I'm going to leave you with this. Human rights is about our environment. And I think the environment, if you look at Japan, if you look at what's been going on so much around the world, is that we have been irreverent to an environment that has served human species for many centuries, many millennia, and we've taken it for granted. Um, so I think the cautionary tale of Fukushima, thank you, Ben. Um, is that people need to start thinking about the long term much more so than we've ever done before. Uh, so with that said and done, um, let's, let's do this last piece. And um, I'd like to dedicate this to anyone out there who is uh, interested in helping Japan and thinking about, like, you know, a different world. I'll just take a second here. Ahead. But it really 
doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountains. Huh? I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life, longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight, I'm not worried about anything, I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord.
the Civil Rights Act of 1964, we affirm through law that men equal under God are also equal when they seek a job, when they go to get a meal in a restaurant, or when they seek lodging for the night in any state in the union. And now the Negro families no longer suffer the humiliation are being turned away because of their race. race, 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 race. Thank you very much. Ross Youth Ensemble. So I'll be outside signing books, and I just want to say thank you again. And um, <clears throat> it's a wonderful program they have with the Stamps Lecture Series. Thank you guys for supporting it, and good night. <laughs>